you know, you guys should do like thumbnails and some other thingy like uh like the YouTube kind of thumbnails where the yeah. guy's going Hi, everyone, and welcome to Royal Path. I'm your host, Andrew, and tonight I'm going to here to ask, uh, or I'm going to ask, and I'm here to ask Father Turbo and Cyprian, what is a food that you guys ate as a kid that you would never eat now? It's just McDonald's. kind of McDonald's, McDonald's right off the bat. Father's got same, it. same, yeah, yep, exact same, <laughs> yeah. That was I, easy. <laughs> yeah, done. All right. So here's the deal. <laughs> I when I was a kid, I used to take three hot dogs and heat them up and then pour ketchup, mustard, and curry on top of them. And like it was like my favorite snack in the entire world. And looking back now, I'm just like, I don't think I don't on top of that, I wouldn't eat that. I don't think I could eat that. I think mm. that would be the rest of my day. It's just like recovering from that meal right there. Same with McDonald's. Because last time I had McDonald's, I was pretty gosh darn sick afterwards. Because I started eating meat again. So, oh, there's all this food I haven't had in a long time. Maybe McDonald's is... Nope. 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 Was not good. Was not For good. me, the absolute worst thing, the nightmare thing that they have there that I ate a lot as a kid is chicken nuggets. Now, now I think they've changed the chicken nuggets now in recent years because they were just so bad. Um, but th- it was pretty bad. Like they that what whatever they were serving when I was a kid was horrible. You know who actually has halfway decent chicken nuggets, and we can move on. This doesn't have to be a whole discussion. Mm-hmm. Wendy's. Yep. Wendy's chicken nuggets are actually mm-hmm. not too bad. I remember having them and being like, if I'm on the road, it's an emergency. This is what I'm getting. Like I'm have getting. You guys quick. ever had raisin canes? Do they have those out by you guys? Yeah, we do. Yeah, we were just talking about it. Woo! <laughs> so, Is it good? I think they might put crack in those things. <laughs> Father, you it's don't like really it. Really good. <laughs> I mean, when I when I first got out here, I was like, "Oh man, raisin canes!" Because it was like a novelty. But as time's gone on, I was talking to Asher about this. It's like the menu's so limited, yeah. you know. Uh. But they, they give you Texas toast, which is good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know who I had, and I was genuinely shocked by how good it was, one, and how I would probably as Popeyes. I oh, remember, Popeyes like, is great. I know. I've never had Popeyes before, and I had it for Father's Day last year. And I was like, oh, my gosh. Everything from, like, that, like, spicy gravy that they put on the mashed potatoes, it's, like, just got this little kick to it. Did you have the red beans and rice? Red beans and rice are phenomenal. Gotta have the red. That, and the dirty good. rice? Oh, so yeah. good. Yeah. Only problem is my kids do not like it. They don't like a single thing except for the really? mac That means you get all of it. No problem. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, I know. But I feel bad as they're looking at me with their tears streaked, like dirty faces. And I'm sitting there like, here, eat my chicken bone. And I like throw it at them. I. <laughs> it's just not right. It leaves a bad taste in my mouth. Worse than McDonald's. But... Also, um, their biscuits. Like I was like, oh my gosh! So I always thought KFC or whoever. I don't mm-hmm. know who had the best biscuits, but I was like, I think Popeyes might actually be up there. So, when I was in college, I went uh, vegetarian. Which is, I went off meat when I was in college. Lame. And, and yeah, very lame. And my go-to, I remember the Popeyes in Adams Morgan in DC because I went to school in DC the Popeyes and Adams Morgan, and I would get fries and red beans and rice, and I would dip my fries in the red beans and rice, like use the fries as a scoop in the red beans and rice. (laughs) I was like, I don't need meat. I'm good. I'm good. (laughs) You know, I forgot about the fries. And then this is the last question I'll ask of the fast. I think maybe I've asked this before, but I don't care. Of the fast food chains, who has the best fries? In and out. 
No. Well, you have asked and it before. He asked it. They have the worst fries. <laughs> I can't do it. I can't yeah. with you guys. <laughs> they have the worst fries, man. I, I, yeah. Who's even the best, the, father? In the studio, the tension is palpable. I'm <laughs> I mean, Del Taco's got some pretty good fries. They do. They do. Not gonna lie, they do. I would say Popeyes. Yeah. I love. I love me some. Popeyes is up there, bro. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're up, there. up there. But have you had Del Taco, Andrew? No, 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 no. Oh. Yeah, Del Taco fries are pretty bomb. And this is exactly what we came to on the last time you asked it. Yeah. So <laughs> I said, I <laughs> said, in and out. <laughs> Father said Del Taco. I agreed. Yeah, Del Taco's bomb. There's no question about it. Yeah, and I can taste them in my mouth right now. That's oh, right. In yeah. and out is like, ooh, like you're lucky you got a double double because the fries are. Oh, I love the what's fries. okay. So the fries are just filler. They're just there to, to, to <laughs> fill you up so that you don't eat like three double doubles. That's all it exists for. They're terrible. They're soggy. They so don't have oh, I love them. I love them. So then, so Father, I know them. that. That uh, my... you know when you go to shake someone's hand, you go shake a man's hand, and it's a, a wet, <laughs> dead <laughs> fish. That's like eating in an in and out fries. Like, uh, 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 like what is this? Yeah. Oh man. Oh, I, I don't know. I love them. Um, I love them. Your uh, Papadia loves the fries from Ponchos, and ever since I've had them, or ever since I've seen them. I have well, she like, loves the carne fries. So that's what I'm saying. That she specifically mentioned oh. the carne fries to me, oh. and I've like wanted to eat them ever since my daughter was born because I kept having this plan of like so like two months ago, two and a half months ago, of like wanting to go get them. And then, father, are you a fan of those? Like oh, the yeah. carne? Fr- oh, they're good. I turned, her, I turned her on to them. Okay. All right. There you go. Well, there yeah. you go. Yeah. All right. Enough of that, guys. Stop talking about fast food, father. Mm. Um. I gave father no warning. I'm going to ask him this question, but I'm going to ask him this question. So don't blame him. We have content, but I've been meaning to ask this for like a month now. Hey, father, what's the deal with unicorns? What's Good up? Question. With that? That's weird. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is it though? Is it? Well, yeah, because they got brought up at the dinner table tonight. I don't know. No. And it's not, it's not odd. It's God. So. Well, the unicorn is a, is an, uh ancient symbol for for christ um like our later ref later reference would be like the medieval period but yeah it's a symbol for christ um and yeah i wasn't prepared for all that yeah Uh, sorry i I have like a i can't give you like an exhaustive deep mythological dive on it sure that's okay um so are they a good or a bad thing because like is it just like any other animal it's both good and bad because there's a part in the psalms specifically the psalms i'm reading right now where david's talking about the horn of the unicorn is like beating him down or something like that that he's like being attacked by lions and the the horn of the unicorn um is like trampling him i can't remember it something like that like is it just like any other animal or because i know that it's a somewhat mythological creature they tend to have like quote unquote like magic wait wait but is it mythological that's really my question well were they like or is it like a symbol i mean he's talking about a lion lion's real why would he why would he just be is he talking about dragons yeah, but he also David oftentimes refers to demons as animals. The lion is roaring after me, you know, like you know. So maybe there's some kind of symbolic something behind unicorns that uh, represents some kind of specific specific spiritual pain or some specific spiritual mm. struggle. I'm not sure. Um, so, like I said, I I didn't give time. I didn't give Father a heads up at all. But I didn't know if there was something that was particular that we needed to know about them vis-a-vis christ so other than but sounds like father gave us the answer so so besides that i want i do want to say something though go about ahead. unicorns that's very interesting um my daughters like so many other girls clearly are obsessed with unicorns mm. and now i don't think we never like pushed unicorn things on them 
I don't know that they were ever. There's something there. I mean, it's you great. know what I mean? Oh, yeah. whoa, there is. My sister that. was obsessed with unicorns. I mean, I mean, I obsessed, was... obsessed. Yeah. My daughters are obsessed, and it's not like a commercial. I mean, we live here. It's not like unicorns are pushed on them, but they they seek out unicorn things. They yeah. want unicorn things. Kim Jong Il was support supposedly born in a cave full of unicorns. So See? there's something there. Wait, which one's still alive? Is it Kim Jong Un? Un is alive. Un. Il is not. Yeah. I wonder if he had a license to ill. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So anyway, he didn't. He so, didn't need one. He's a dictator. No. He was the one issuing the licenses. Man, <laughs> man. I'm just gonna say. All right, so we're gonna move on. So um, Cyprian had proposed that we talk about that. There's this um, Jordan Peterson video where mm-hmm. him and Pajot. Mm-hmm. Pajot? Okay. Pajot. Yeah. Yeah. Him and Pajot are speaking with a uh, Muslim guy. Well, to be fair, yeah. The, the The video says Jordan Peterson, Jonathan Pajot, and Muhammad Hijab. So, for people who don't know Muhammad Hijab, he is a. Um, I think he considers himself to be like a Muslim scholar. But he's kind of like, if you could imagine, like, the radical Muslim Andrew Tate. Okay. (laughs) That's basically what he is. He's like a YouTube influencer. He's, I mean, he's, from what I can tell, he is quite knowledgeable in terms of the Quran, in terms of Islamic history. I don't know if he's, if he would be, if other Islamic scholars would call him a scholar, but he's about as close to that as you're going to get in terms of like a young, relatively young YouTube personality. And he's uh, very emblematic of this sort of um, UK. I don't want to use the term like radical Muslim, but I think that that's what outs- people who, you know, outside of that would. Go- but the types of guys who would go off and join ISIS who are from UK. He's like emblematic of kind of like that group with like very kind of anti-West, anti-Jewish, certainly anti-globalist, kind of a, I, I don't know, Muslim, I don't know, Muslim nationalist, if that, a radical Muslim, basically, right? And Jordan Peterson, the video is called, which is crazy that the video is called this because that's not what it turned out to be. It's called uh, Talking to Muslims About Christ. Muhammad Hijab and Jonathan Pajot. And the thing that came up to me is, as I saw this, is that basically Jordan Peterson and Muhammad Hijab spend the whole time talking about Christ, and we don't really hear much about Christ from the Orthodox Christian who's sitting there. And so I thought maybe one of the things that we could do, perhaps, is sort of answer some of the things that came up. I don't know, Father, if you're, if you're kind of up to that, if we can just go through and kind of just react to yeah. it. Because we've talked about Jordan yeah. Peterson. Did you see the whole thing? Have you seen the whole thing? I've, I've, I've basically watched the it. whole... I've basically watched the whole thing. A lot of it is like, you know, the kind of Petersonian navel-gazing, like mm-hmm. getting into the symbology and stuff. And mm-hmm. a lot of it is that. But there's a middle section that I wanted to sort of go through that we can react to where they're talking about Uh, Christ in Islam and just Christ in general. And yeah, I mean, I, I, I was hoping that we could kind of go through it because I think even I myself, and then there's some other people as well, who people in my, around me in my circle who kind of get, um, and we've briefly touched on it, who like get mystified by when they learn that like, Oh, Muslims, like believe in Jesus and his miracles. Yeah. Oh, they venerate his mother. Oh, they believe that he's coming back at the end of days. Like, what is all of this? Yeah. Right. And they're like, oh, I think maybe Islam is okay. Yeah, that's a, that's that's a real trap. Right. And so I thought maybe this would be a good like entree for us to go and be like, okay, here's here's the problem. Here's the problem. Here's uh, is that mm-hmm. could we start there? Yeah, I mean, you know, we could go yeah. anywhere. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Isn't Andrew Tate Muslim? Didn't he end up Muslim? Seriously? I thought so. I thought he like touched his toe in orthodoxy, then moved on to being a Muslim. 
He certainly and, doesn't talk like a like a. He's not an observant Muslim, that's for sure. All the things yeah. that he talks about. I don't know what that means. I mean, I don't know. He he was. I saw one thing where he was talking about orthodoxy because he's in Romania, and um, like I seen a video where he like made the sign of the cross really awkwardly and weird, you know. So I. I who knows? Who knows? I thought he ended up, you know, just. I'm just gonna check real quick. You're gonna check on Andrew Tate being a Muslim. Andrew Tate, Muslim. Islam fixes all from September 14th, 2001. Prominently featured as Andrew Tate with a shirt unbuttoned three times down. That's what I'm saying. What's <laughs> I mean, Andrew Tate, the like Andrew Tate doesn't become Muslim, Muslim becomes Andrew Tate. So that's what said. Strong. No, I'm just saying. Oh. Yeah. He's, kinda, he's 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 taken over the uh, Chuck Norris meme at this point. <laughs> sure. Remember, because it's yeah. almost Chuck Norris, but it's like Chuck's too old now. So Andrew, Tate, which, which which makes sense, kickboxer, the whole nine. You know what I mean? There's kind of there's sure. something there. Okay, so um, Father, so this is about. I think there's a a good. I think we could go till about the time that Jonathan Pajot talks, which is about ten minutes um and i think just at any time maybe we can just father if you want to stop it or andrew or whatever if we want to just stop and like clarify some things um word yeah okay word so this is there the, the, it's it's in these little chapters and it says uh this chapter says islam recognizes jesus but not the son of god so i'm just going to start there on this section and how in incongruent it was with scientific narratives. You went to a pastor, you said, or a church cleric yeah. or something, and then you left the church. Now, I've yeah. got a question. Do you still have the same position, or have you changed your position? Well, I've changed my position a lot. I was only 13 then, you know, and oh, okay. I, was, I was caught up in, in the battle, you know, to, insofar it was manifested in me when I was 13. I was caught in the battle between enlightenment rationality and traditional narrative belief yes. i had yes. no idea how to reconcile those two things do, do you feel like you can do that now i'm doing my best to reconcile so let me be yes and i think yeah. well i certainly can do it a lot more than i did when i was 13. let me give you an example right this this point when you were 13 i think you were thinking straight i'll be uh, sorry to be very straight <laughs> let, let, for, it's hard to believe yeah, that someone yeah, yeah. is disagreeable with you yeah. as you no, would manage you were, that. Yeah, because someone with an iq of 180 or whatever you have, yeah, someone of your intelligence. When you were when you were 13, you probably had an IQ of I don't know 120 or something, yeah. So you was you were operating like my friend over here, Ali Dawa, so it's on his level. Well, at the age of 13, but what I was going to say was that you know the reason why I think you were because look at the Trinity, for example, look at the schisms. Now this goes to your specialism, that the idea of three all powerful entities that Jesus is all powerful, that the Father is all powerful, the Son is all powerful, and the Holy Spirit is all powerful, but there's not all what uh, there's not Three all powerful. There's one all powerful. You have one ultimately willing being, which is a person, which is Jesus. And then another person, which is ultimately willing, which is the Son. The Quran says about this: it says, In chapter 23, verse number one, 91, it says that Allah has not taken any son, and He does He did not have any creator with Him. Had that been the case, they would have stripped one another for what they, they would have competed and tried to outstrip one another for power. Meaning this idea of three all-powerful persons is unintelligible to say the least. The idea that Jesus Christ... Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah this is... Because this is what, what, he's doing some, some weird... Well, there's a couple of things that are going on. Like you're, you're dealing with... Um, you're dealing with certain um, sociological mm. tools, mm -hmm. right? You're dealing with certain um, certain aspects of like uh, him being a rhetorician, you know? the, the rhetorical tools, and you could tell, tools. and he's playing, and he knows he's playing those yeah. two guys too. Like for right? instance, like I'll just give you a real low hanging fruit when he jumps into the Arabic. That's exactly it, the Arabic is an, is a is a kind of you know um you know in Gladiator when uh 
Russell Crowe Gladiator when um, the Emperor um, Joaquin Phoenix you know, like stabs him mm-hmm. uh, right before they go on on stage, whatever. Mm-hmm. That's kind of like the equivalent of him doing that. Mm-hmm. Because what he's doing is it's it's very similar to uh, appeal to authority mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. he shows his mastery of like i have this leg up of i have a language and mm-hmm. this language therefore is a symbol of my access to a whole essential universe of information and knowledge that you don't have mm-hmm. and i'm going to use it in such a way in this public debate to really kind of like undermine and cripple you. So it's it's a type of poisoning of the well. It's a it's a it's a call to authority. It's all those things. And you know, they don't even they don't even catch it. <laughs> well, the, I, mean? I mean the the interesting and I mean if if I honestly if I was sitting but again it's like even to not play those games, but the thing of like sitting there and you know the question out of my mouth would have been like, can I just stop you for a minute? Um why did you do why did you do the Arabic? Yeah. just now yeah because yeah. like i yeah. i don't i don't know if you know i don't speak arabic yeah i don't know dr peterson do you speak arabic yeah. no um yeah. mo- i don't think most of the audience probably speaks arabic i'm just wondering you told it to us in english after that right. um why did why you, did you why did you do it in arabic yeah you know what was another, that about the, another thing to kind of pay attention to is you know he he did a real quick um strong manning iron manning uh pajot's character yeah so he's like hey you're the expertise on this boom, boom, boom. oh he did it to peterson too he you said I mean? you've got 180 yeah. iq yeah. and when you were it right yeah oh no he's he's very he, he's he's completely outmatched them from a rhetorical standpoint there's no question about that yeah yeah, yeah. i think i just would have been like yeah this isn't happening like you can film me walking off, but like this isn't happening. Like I'm not gonna debate this with you. I don't care if I look stupid. I'm not doing this. Like you are an abrasive personality. You clearly there's nothing I can say to change your heart. Yeah. And I'm gonna get you and you're actually gonna end up blaspheming by me talking with you. And I don't wanna be culpable for your sin. So I'm gonna Yes. Walk- yes. <laughs> that was my exact my exact thought. <laughs> like I think I think it would be different if somebody had, you know, if somebody was a the person that came to my mind immediately was like Father Peter Hears, mm-hmm. right? Where it's oh. like, where it's like, because then Father Peter Hears could be like, okay, we could do this. Let me give you the Greek, right? And then I'll and then I'll go ahead and I'll I'll give it to you in English, okay? Yeah. Like that would be the only situation wherein it would be like, oh. Ah, I see where you're misunderstanding. Here's how yeah. you're being heretical right now. Yeah. Let me, because I think what, because one of the things that he does is he misrepresents the Trinity as well. I mean, di- didn't. Oh yeah, he totally. Well, he does because all Muslims do. <laughs> Forgive me. Because all Muslims do. So. Wasn't there part in the Quran where it said that the mother of God was part of the Trinity or something like that? I thought. Well, like... they, they don't believe in the Trinity. They don't acknowledge they the, believe Trinity. In the Trinity. Well, according to the Christians, they say according to Christians, the mother of God was like part of the Trinity or I don't something know. like that. See, this thought... gets this gets you know, we're just it's dicey here because I am not a mm-hmm. expert in Islam. I'm not like a I'm not like an Islamic apologist, you know. Like there's some good good points that I'm aware of, you know what I mean? Um but the strength of this, I mean, it's kind of hard because right, we're in a weird trap because the strength of this is really going to be kind of critiquing Jonathan Pajot, which, you know, we all kind of like are loath to do, don't want to do that. But at the same token, it's kind of like, I got to have to say something because who else, who has the, who has such an audience right now? Nobody. Like the, the largest, there's the, what uh one two three so the four largest audiences Mm. orthodoxy are patriarch kirill (laughs) Mm -hmm. you know what i mean vladimir Vladimir putin uh Mm -hmm. jonathan bajo and jordan peterson yeah i mean that's what you're stuck with in in regards of the world encountering christ Mm -hmm. right because like Mm -hmm. you don't want to fall in that trap of making some dichotomy some unfortunate 
you know, false dichotomy between Christ and orthodoxy, but like you guys get what I'm saying. So like mm-hmm. those are those are the representatives, you know what I mean? Like those are the people who have, you know, just quantity, um, the volume of of ears, you know, and eyes. So for and this is, you know, people don't want to hear this. And and I think that's the thing. It's like for I haven't seen it yet. I I haven't seen what Cyprian's gonna bring up, but like, you know, if he's not coming up with something, then I'm just gonna say that's problematic because this guy Well Habibi, well father father forgive Habibi, me forgive me. Habibi, I'll just let me say this real quick. Habibi, yes. You know, he's that that's a joke, by the way, if you know yes, him. yes. Habibi, yes. uh Habibi <laughs> like many Muslims, he's not he's not playing around. And he, and I I've seen this happen so many times this this type of um, this type of approach and so it's it's very much this is kind of like a little snapshot of how the church found herself not that I want to say the church rep- is represented by John DePaggio or Jordan Peterson but how the church found herself in 2020 it's like yeah oh you don't even know you're in a fight I mean that was so much of our conversation it's like oh oh you don't even know you're in a fight do you. You know, like everyone just kind of like getting molested by the powers and principalities via the state. They didn't even realize what was going on. You know, some still don't, you know, so Mm -hmm. it's like watching that in real time. Father, as a bigger principle, as a bigger principle, because I think this is what this is what kind of when I saw this, what kind of viscerally got me. Yeah. And I think that this is a this is like a larger principle, and I, and I need to know where where's where am I? Because I know I'm somewhere off here because I probably should have been more dispassionate because it got me viscerally right. But it's like for someone in, I'm sitting here. This is a large platform, millions of potential people watching. For whatever I know about the Trinity, what I know is he got the Trinity wrong, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. If I just sit there and do nothing like what is i guess i guess what i'm wondering is like two well, you're kind what, of, we'd be culpable this is, this is what i'm asking this is what i'm asking this is what i'm asking yes what where does where does my where does my responsibility as actually, a christian lie there's actually like a really rich vein here that i think we kind of just stumbled on is like what is our role when we mm-hmm. are challenged by our mm-hmm. faith like what what happens when a person comes to you and says like no okay so like an example would be like one of the first priests orthodox priests i ever met said that they used to meet for a bible study and one day at a restaurant or something let's say i hop and they're sitting there at i hop like eating breakfast or whatever having a bible study and a muslim guy walked by and said pointed at each one of their bibles and he said hmm four different translations and he held up a Quran and said, there's only one translation of this. And then like walked off, you know, like what, like what, what is our role then as a person? I mean, I know what I would do in that situation. And what I have done is like, I'm not debating this with you. Like, I'm not debating this with you. Like I, you know, I don't want to be, you don't have to see here. No, the that's, there's was, nothing theological there. Well, well, well not even just well, conversation. Well, the, thing is, the thing is, it's all about context. Like you mm-hmm. don't have to, cause you're eating at IHOP. Right, guys trying to pick a fight. That's one right. thing. When you're invited to the context of a debate, <laughs> mm-hmm. that's different, right? Like we can't that like that's that's totally different. You know what I'm saying? So I hit decline. It, get you yeah, I mean, well, you could you could decline, right? You could be like, well, I don't feel that I have the theological chops to right. do this. I don't feel like. And Jonathan Pajot at a certain point does say, oh, well, I've seen videos. So Jonathan Pajot had seen videos of this guy. Like he had seen videos of him, right? So, so it's like- he's going to be antagonistic. Oh, the, he specifically says, I've seen videos of you out in public threatening violence against non-Muslims. Well, what was his response to that? He was like, oh, well. What are you going to do? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean- because like this is interesting. I don't know if this is even gonna work. I'm gonna try to tie it into. No, I'll tell Father. I'll tell you what his response was. Actually, that was his first response. What his response to them was: Have I ever had any? He's like, well, you say violence, but 
Have I ever had any cases against me? Have I ever had any legal oh, action against me? Thing. Have I exactly? That's but that was his re- that was his response back. It means you weren't caught, homie. Yeah, that was his oh, that yeah. was his response back. He was trying. Well, what he was trying to say was, well, millions of people have seen my videos. Millions of people have seen what you say me inciting violence. Have I? Ha- do I have any cases against me for inciting violence in public? Yeah. Yeah. See, I, I mean, I think the thing is, first of all, let's just get some things on the table, right? Mm. Real path moment. Uh, what's the problem with Islam? The problem with Islam is they deny the Christ. Amen. So some people on the way right, they just like, they can't, they, I mean, they can't handle it because of their xenophobia. And I don't throw that word around lightly. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So like, I mean, I'm not into burqas, but like the problem isn't the burqa. You know what I mean? Uh, the problem is the, den- the denial of Christ. Because where people get all hung up on Islam, they get hung up on like cultural things, which are whatever. Because I'll find nasty cultural things anywhere. I'll find sure. them. Like you sure. can do that. So sure. we just we just want to really get to some of the core things, right? It's it it it's the doctrine of demons. It's a Christian heresy. It's not, you know what I mean? It it we have to really be we have to kind of like hold where we need to hold because all the other stuff that like people get caught up in. It never, it never allows someone to really see the point. Like so many mm-hmm. debates, just kind of get around these insular like moments, you know. Well, he he he's gonna go on to deny Christ right here, like, and he's gonna lay out the denial. Should we should we check that out and then pull it apart? I guess, yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's just hard to. You it's know, hard to like, listen to you. I mean, yeah, you like want to smack the, you know, like. I mean, this. The well, the, 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 the I think people. one of the one of the important parts here is that all of us are sitting here saying this is hard to listen to, and if I was it in the room, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't remain. Silent. Like, I wouldn't have remained it. silent, but you know, it's there's there <laughs> is a, sweet tea. Yeah, <laughs> for real. There is a, there is an orthodox thought leader and influencer in the room, so we can oh, we can see man. we. Response. Teachers, for, I know that there are schisms and there's differences of opinion among Christians, but the, the fact that you have this human nature where Jesus is walking and he sees the tree and he can't eat from the tree, he doesn't know that the tree is uh, in season or not, or that he doesn't know when the hour is or whatever it may be. The Quran says it very clearly. Him and his mom used to eat food. This proposition that they're limited and unlimited at the same time is unintel- it's a contradiction. It's an affront to logic. That's it. Co- this will cause you cognitive dissonance because if you want to be a rational actor and you want to See, be, that's the thing. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to be a rational actor, oh but you do God. when you do your scientific that's experiments. The point. That's true. So, why'd you? That's so, what he chooses to argue. Like, that's what Peter said. Well, hold on. I got it. Well, but go and, and also, and also, uh, Father, when I saw this, I wanted to specifically ask you about being a rational actor because the church says we are rational. The church yeah. says that, that 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 we are rational. Yes, but but how the church defines rational. Ah, very good. And how he, which is kind of which is funny because he's the way they define rational is the same way that the West defines rational, mm-hmm. which is not the same way the East is defining rational. Right. Mm-hmm. So they're defining rational in regards of, you know, um, empir- when you say they, you're talking about. Uh, Muhammad Hijab and Jordan Peterson. You're not talking yes, about this. yes. Okay, and they're defining say, it in a Western way. Correct. When we say rational, we're talking about the we, we are talking about the news, the intelligent aspect of of mind, right? Mm. Um, being a really discernment, mm-hmm. right? When they say rational, they're talking about really the kind of like faculties of man exclusively, the the something that is ordered according to man's limited perspective mm-hmm. whereas for us that's that's why like we would say like like the noetic insight or philocolic knowledge quote unquote you know like there are these things that the the paradoxes within orthodoxy are the revelation of the divinity mm-hmm. because we 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 enter into them and and those who are born of the spirit of god can discern these things because the natural man can't discern the things of the spirit. They're natural men. They're not men of the spirit. 
Mm. And so that's why we can enter into certain things and be like, oh, it makes perfect sense. This is the revelation of God. Because these paradoxes, not contradictions, paradoxes reveal that. And and that's where and that's where he's trying to set up the idea of limited and unlimited or visible and invisible yeah. as a contradiction yeah. as opposed to a paradox. Because we do live in a world of visible and invisible, mm -hmm. where things are visible and invisible. We do live in a world where things are limited and unlimited. Mm -hmm. And and the thing is, is this is where things about like the scandal of the cross and you know so much of what's found in in the epistle of Hebrews and all throughout the pastoral epistles, you know, about just the scandal of the cross. Like, how is it that God became man? The incarnation is like what? Like, it doesn't make sense. And so for a lot of people now, because we're so far removed from the ancient world, the ancient mindset. And, you know, philosophy in particular, people don't understand how crazy it is for Christianity to claim that, no, God became man. That the, that the, the spirit of God, God, right, the, the, the creator of all things became incarnate. That is just madness, mm -hmm. right? People lose sight of that. And so because they lose sight of it, they're easily, it's one aspect of potentially being sideswiped in these type of arguments. Because then you don't know what to really latch on to. But if you understand the scandal in which Christianity was nestled in, in the ancient world, then you understand why the, why Muslims go to these points. You know what I mean? And then it's usually like, oh, and then you start just, you lean into the paradox. And then you start saying, well, yeah, this is why what you have is a moralistic, you know, human religious system that justifies your appetites and what we are involved with is the unification with the living god <laughs> you know what i mean like everything that you're everything that you're about everything that islam is about is is nothing but you know when people when atheists it's it's funny to me when atheists and other people talk about you know christianity as this kind of like giant hoax that's perpetrated on people for the sake of control i'm like oh you mean islam that's what Islam yeah. is. For real. Islam yeah. is this is this total, obviously very worldly, you know, fleshly system that's designed to control people. I mean, it's pretty clear that's that's what mm -hmm. was used for to unite the tribes. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? There's nothing otherworldly about it. And There's to unite the tribes under Mohammed. Correct. Specifically. Correct. Specific. Correct. So, Father, isn't, I mean, isn't, this is, this is what stands out to me about, because I've heard this from Muslims before, where they're like, it's irrational that God could become man, or it's irrational that an unlimited being could limit him, could limit himself, could condescend. But to me, that seems like that is actually the measure of, uh, of supreme omnipotence. He can do whatever he wants. Yeah, well, that's it, the it, measure exactly, of. That's, that's the point of the cross. <laughs> yeah. That, it's the point of the cross. Like that, that's why that, that just, it proves the point. Like, yeah, because that's why he is God. And <laughs> you he know what I mean? do that, then he's not limitless. Mm -hmm. And Exactly. I, so if your God can't do that, your God's not God. Your God sucks. I tell you, in this imaginary argument, that this imaginary debate, if I hadn't have walked out in an alternate universe where I'm sitting there instead of Peugeot and Pearson, that why I got so like, that's the point he argues, is the subtle little jab. If I heard correctly his jab at christ saying he didn't know if it was in season or he didn't know like mm -hmm. about the tree like oh as though he doesn't have the knowledge of what that tree is and that he couldn't that like maybe it was just it wasn't the time of year for him to grab fruit in christ well first of all just stop right there he knew that it was not in season <laughs> you know what i mean that's that's, that's part of the that's part of the parable actually that's, that's where, part of him showing his power is that that's where I would jump in. Not, well, I don't want to be a rational actor. Yeah. That's not where I jump in. I jump in at, oh, no, 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 no. He knew exactly what he was doing. Yeah. Yeah, but there but, is no but yes. Peterson does that because he doesn't know the scriptures. He doesn't know the scriptures. And and I, I mean, I don't know. Like, this is tough. I don't want to, like, start some kind of open war with Pajot or anything like that. But, like, listen, if you don't know, again, the context is, like, if you're going on a show and you know what you're up against, then, I mean, to just go there. And again, I haven't seen it. 
maybe there's a portion there we we missed and he just well hold on well hold on then let's go ahead yeah <laughs> this is like that scene in oh, Jaws for, with the, the two things. fingernails for me on the chalk. His rationality should be subordinated to something above it. And I'm trying to subordinate myself to that. And so my my reaction to what you're saying um, mm. is that it's an in this isn't an insult. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm telling you what my reaction is. Please say it's it. not it's yeah. not even a criticism. Of it's, course. I find the discussion that discussion as soon as it started i found that less interesting than what we were doing before it was harder for me to focus okay. on and right. i i think the reason for that is that it 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 transforms to some and i'm not saying this isn't necessary at sometimes okay. but it transforms the transcendent into something like an intellectual and propositional discussion and so in okay. some sense we're debating perhaps not the fine points of theology because yeah. they're more like the blunt points of theology yeah, yeah. but there's something about that that there's something about that that isn't what I want to do with you. Yes. You know, and it isn't that it's not necessary. So let okay. let me flip right. it around right, to right, some right. degree. So one of the yeah. things I'm very curious about is obviously the figure of Christ is yeah. contentious. Yes. And so the Jews don't know what to make of Christ yes. in some fundamental sense because he seems like the last he seems like an what would you, a continuation of the prophetic tradition in yes. some real sense, plus he was Jewish, so that makes things complicated. And then, mm -hmm. of course, the Christians put the figure of Christ as, as central in some real sense, but that begs the question of the relationship between Christ and God. And then in the Muslim community, Christ is also a central figure. And so I'm curious about that. And we could say we have doctrinal differences about what constitutes that centrality. It's like, fair enough, and I would also not say that I understand what that centrality means. Mm -hmm. Like, so one of the ways I would understand that, let's say, is that in, in the Western tradition, and I don't know to what degree this is true in the mm -hmm. Muslim tradition, one of the attributes of what- Wait, I just noticed something about that, this. That, I can say right now, John- They're in a mosque, like they're on a- oh, He's not gonna say minute, He was a last minute addition. Look at the chair he's in. They're like, hey, oh. hey, why don't you come on stage, man? Just come oh. on stage. Well, here's well, here's another thing. Noting the chairs, do you notice something about their feet? They have no shoes on. Yeah, yeah. They're in a mosque. they're in a mosque. They're in a mosque. Yeah. They're in a mosque. So they had this. <laughs> oh man. I oh I thought we knew. Yeah, I was like, why am I? Why are they in a mosque in the first place? That was my yeah. Whole, like yeah, right I mean, away, I I I, I, it, I knew it looked like a mosque, but I I wasn't. I wasn't no, absolutely on, sure until just now when I saw them with no shoes. I mean, it's home field advantage. His demon. That's what I'm saying. Him. Like, no, <laughs> like his, like, I don't know what Pajot's doing there. I mean, whatever, you know, I don't know. I don't know where I'll end up in my life, but it's like home field advantage. It's like, no, I mean, your small, your God, small G is powering you right now. Like I'm out of my element. Like my skin would be on fire. I've checked. I've like walked in to Protestant churches since becoming Orthodox and felt uncomfortable. Like, oh, I don't I don't know if I like it in here. Like, this is kind of a, let alone walking into a mosque. I would just be like, I, I don't know if I should be in here. Like, let's, well, let's, do it let's well, let's let's see if he let's see if he steps up. Let's see if he steps up. Christ now would be the is, time. psychologically is the logos. And so if we're engaged in dialogue, which is dual yeah, logos, yeah, yeah, yeah. then we're embodying the spirit of something like mutual enlightenment. And that's then the presence of that spirit in the in the genuine confines of temporal reality, right? It's something like the infinite descending to the finite to illuminate us. And to the degree that we can have a dialogue in good faith, which mm -hmm. is also a religious notion, then we can engage in that process of dialogos, and that transforms and redeems us. And then when I say, well, do I believe that? I say, well, it isn't just that I believe it as a proposition. It's that I can tell when it's happening. And so can you, I think. It's like, you're going to see that this conversation will ebb and flow, you know? And yeah. some of the time it's going to grip you. You think we, we're at the heart of the matter. And sometimes yes. your attention is going to wander. And your attention is going to wander when we're off the path. And yes. so I would say that... Yes to the degree that you and I are communicating, this is a religious way of thinking about it, is that we're doing our best to embody the spirit of the logos. And if that's working, then we're making progress. And I know that in the Western tradition, that's part of what has been conceptualized as the fundamental attribute of 
of the figure of Christ. And I know that Christ is central in the Muslim tradition. And so one of the things I would want to know is yeah. not how we differ doctrinally, yeah. because I don't even think I'm qualified to, to yeah, so debate you on that case. We've got the guy here. Well, Jonathan <laughs> might have some things to say, but, yeah, yeah. but what I would like to, to yeah. know instead is why do you believe that the figure of Christ is central in some sense, or maybe I've got that wrong, although okay. I don't think so. Why do you think the figure of Christ is central both to the Muslim faith and the Christian faith? And what do you think that says about what we share in common? Because I really don't understand that. It's a mystery to me. Okay. Uh, so now, mm. before he answers, <laughs> did, it, did either of you understand anything that Jordan Peterson said oh. over that three minutes? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. He's... <laughs> was there? Word. Was is it just me, or was there absolutely nothing there? The, the introspective atmosphere. That Father, did you did you get did you understand any of that? I mean, <laughs> I could try to I could try to inject some meaning. You know what I mean? But I'm not looking to do him any favors. You know. Sometimes uh, when you polish a turd, it's. Just... I, I did. I did notice that even Muhammad Hijab was like Jonathan Pajot. <laughs> might have something to say about that yeah. like yeah. maybe jonathan would like to talk but see you know what this is i just want to say this real quick i don't want to believe the point but whatever episode however many episodes back you know i hate to refer to our own episodes like that but like i, I was i was pointing out the logos interestingly enough that logos conference right and i was sharing with you it's like that's that's when i knew the emperor had no clothes with in regards to peterson because if you remember where I was talking about that, it's like, here's a logo conference, logos conference, right? Pierce was the keynote speaker. It's kind of, it's right before, it's it's right when he, it's a little bit before he kind of took his nosedive, whatever. And mm -hmm. I remember looking at it, not to be that guy, but I remember being like, number one, oh, the emperor has no clothes. Number two, he didn't say anything. He just yeah. got, he just got up and just basically monologued a lot of kind of like psycho garble. Mm -hmm. and and the ortho crowd just like golf clapped and ate it up they were like yes 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 and i remember thinking like okay this is that that's when i turned like cause I, I remember watching it mm -hmm. when it was you know streamed or whatever that's when i turned i was like oh nope I, I see this for for what it is you know unless he quote unquote repents now i'm just saying that because what you just saw right there is pretty much exactly what I saw at that logos conference and, and a lot of it is just because, you know, I'm trying to be charitable to the man, but he's probably like, okay, here I am. Uh, I'm in this forum. He's probably, he was probably spinning from having, you know, his, his mm -hmm. meteoric rise to fame. Uh, all of these quote unquote, you know, he's surrounded by Orthodox priests. I'm sure there's a couple of bishops there and they're just fawning after him. Like he's Christ himself. And he showed up there with like nothing prepared. He just like, hey, I can just get up here and just rant because I because I'm that good, whatever. And I mean, he was right in the sense of no one said a thing. But I, I was like, so what did you just say? You know what I mean? And I think this mo is problematic insofar as him doing his own thing and him pulling, you know angry middle class upper middle class men out of the basements and out of their like whatever okay great but in regards of representing christianity orthodoxy and trying to be like some some level of authority and spokesman this is i mean it's just i hate that we keep coming back to him but it's like he these things keep happening you know what i mean well he ha he has incredible influence and I mean, it would be it would be one thing to me. I probably would have just skipped this and not even looked at it if it was just him and Muhammad Hijab. Yeah. Because then I've been like, oh, it's two heretics talking to each other about a topic they know nothing about. Right. Okay, fine. That's like that's not for me. But I feel like it comes. It, there's a, a completely different thing if here you have an Orthodox person sitting next to Jordan Peterson, who I guess knows some theology. And says not even anything about Peterson's representation of Christ. Well, the other thing is too is you 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 notice that Peterson's like the one thing I can't tell you what he what the one thing I can tell you that I know that he was trying to say mm. is he's trying to say like look what I really want to get to is 
I see a I see a road where I can be part of a world peace solution. Mm-hmm. And I want to talk about that because that's what's interesting. That's essentially what he's mm-hmm. trying to get at. Look and at he's like, camera. don't waste your let's not waste our time on this, on the petty squabblings. Let's talk about the things that unite us because that's the real problem we have. Because you know, he's put out a couple messages the last few months about that. To the church. And so which forgive me, but that's all the more where I'm like, Antichrist, you know, like mm-hmm. because so ecumen- I, ecumenism. Ecu- yes, what you want. but antichrist, because you start antichrist. talking about, well, this is Christ centrally in these religions. Boom, 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 boom. Right. Yeah. And that's a setup, right? Because I'm gonna tell you something. Like you're not generally speaking, an Orthodox priest, an, an Orthodox Christian, just general who's like an Orthodox Christian, um, isn't going to be one isn't gonna be interested in those things. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah. here's why. Because they know that the the solution is Christ, and they're not gonna care if that sounds like a fundamentalist, whatever. Now, mm-hmm. you can find yourself in a situation where you may be led to kind of like be in the lion's den. So I'm not faulting it for being like, I'm going to be in a lion's den next month. And like, I just prayerfully said, okay, you know, I'm going to be in a lion's den, but I'm just not, you know, this is a great opportunity to not pull punches, right? If you're in the lion's den, you don't pull punches and you know why you're there. That's, so I don't fault someone for being in the lion's den, which is why, again, people who get on the far right, that's the thing I worry. It's like, you know, if someone, like for me, like this event that I've been doing, I could see where someone would be like, oh, I always knew he was kind of like that because I'll be at this one event. But the thing is, is my whole purpose is to present Christ and to really call out that dominant narrative. You, you see what I'm saying? So what is the dominant narrative you're speaking? Well, to? well, the event I'm going to be in is going to be a, it's typically, I think it'd be associated with a more ecumenical. Okay. Okay. And okay. I plan on going in, you know. Guns blazing. Well, just being, I'm not, I'm not looking to soften anything. You know what I mean? We get it. So, You're going to burn the place down. We get it. So, so I just think that like in that type of situation, you know, what are you really, what are you really doing? Because you're an ambassador for Christ, as the, as the scriptures say. And Jordan Peterson, you know, to be charitable to him, that's not, he's not interested in that. He, for him, Christ is a natural, you know, kind of like result of the Western tradition. Like, yeah, you know, it, it might, it might as well be, he might as well have been invented by the West. Yeah. And, that, and that's how he sees it. You know what I mean? Yes. But, but, I mean, you. I would hope for Jonathan Pajot, it's a little different, but I don't know. I, I don't want to, I don't, you know, I understand to be charitable. I'm sure he's just like, look, I, I was just trying to be a humble guest. I, I don't, but like, this is a, I, I don't know. And again, this is why people think, you know, we'd be fundamentalists, why I'm a fundamentalist, I guess, but I don't really care because, um, again, if I'm at IHOP sitting around with someone and some guy says something, me just looking at him going like okay that was weird that's a i'm not gonna trip on someone and be like that's but if someone invites me and they're like okay father turbo i want you to you know if the unitarian methodist you know association of you know ball loving christians calls me and says hey can you talk to us about orthodoxy i'm not gonna go in there and just like go like this and like have them tell me everything that they got to say about, you know, how they think Christ is really their kind of Pied Piper. You know what I mean? I'm not going to do that. Right. Like I'm going there for a duel. Let's duel. Well, I guess that's my question. Father is like, I understand not actively, like actively offering the incense. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh But then as I read the lives of the saints over and over and over again i see saints well just even i mean great great example is uh saint cyprian of antioch right and justina uh, saint justina when they're brought 
to which was just i mean just mm. on saturday when they're brought to be executed a soldier who's mm-hmm. a christian professes christ the ictesis saint mm-hmm. and and he's a saint mm-hmm. and so and it's over and over and over again in the lives of the saints that like there's a moment where and this is what i want to know is it's like i mean peter de- peter denies christ mm-hmm. right but it's like an act of denial or being quiet. Like what I'm what I'm trying to get my head around is when you're presented in that situation and and Christ is being misrepresented. Because to me, like like you say, like like Andrew said, like I mean, nails on a chalkboard. It is because I have a relationship with Christ, mm-hmm. and what's being represented is not the re- dude. I would I would if somebody said that about just somebody that I know, right. if they just misrepresented my buddy. Right. I was like, oh, he's, you know, he's this, he's that. He got arrested for a DUI. I'd be like, whoa, 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 stop. No, he didn't. Right. What are you talking about? Right. Like if I would do, like if I would do that for my friend, but when it's Christ, I would stay quiet. I'm just wondering where does my culpability? I mean, lie? there's a, there's a bone in me that gets struck and I just go, oh, hell no. That's kind of what, That's I'm, what just, I'm saying. Yeah, no, I'm done. But but at the same time, what I'm wondering is like, I also don't want to go too far. Royal path, right? Mm-hmm. So it's like sense of justice. I'm trying to get around my sense of justice mm-hmm. to a certain degree, like mm-hmm. the justice of man, and that it's my job to right these wrongs and these sorts of things, right? Mm-hmm. I'm well, wondering think, if maybe well, it's not better yeah, for me to be quiet and say, Lord, I have mean, mercy. Like, yeah, I don't know. I, mean, I think it's just context, right? Because again, on the one hand, it's like there's a very personal pastoral aspect to this for every person and like you and it, you know you have to know your line right over and over again like you got to know your line but the key to that though is you know one the one things that you can do to help discern that line is like are you offended out of because i just watch watch me on this when someone like Someone says your buddy, like, oh, he's, you know, he got a DUI and this and this and that. And you're like, no, he didn't, blah, 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 right? Now, just see if you can feel the difference in this. Someone says about your wife, well, you know, she da 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 da. Oh, you're muted. Say it again. You're getting punched. Right. Like I'm not, it's not, right. it's not a matter of no, she isn't. You're getting right. punched. Right. Now, but I want to, but, but watch me on this, right? Feel the difference. This is because mm. this is going to be a thing, right? When you defend your friend to some degree, there's a, there's a, there's a level of altruism that's there that isn't with mm. your wife. You, can you feel the difference? I understand that. You, you, it's you, not you, it's because it's me directly if you're insulting my wife yeah you're attacking me exactly, directly exactly and so this is where and i know people don't want to hear this uh, whatever but this is where if you if someone truly wants to discern uh, this I you see. got you have to I see this. because i because i've encountered this in myself i mean i'll never forget you know i got spanked so hard 20 you know not not long in that 25 years ago 24 years ago yeah whatever like i got spanked hard because of this very thing this is why i learned this because i got into this whole thing some some debate with some like they were jehovah's witnesses whatever and it was just like it was like god stuck a turkey baster in my mind and sucked out everything i knew and i was just completely and i and i was just like what just happened you know, the most basic points, it was just like, and I, and it was just a really great lesson. I was humiliated. I was embarrassed because I went in there in pride. I was, I wasn't wanting really to defend Christ. I was wanting to defend, like I, I had made Christ my possession. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? I had made Christ an extension of myself in the wrong way. And I went in there wanting to be like, look, this is why for me, some of the debate and kind of like apologetics scene, it's fine. I, I I watch it. I'm into it just because of like my vocation kind of, but on a spiritual level, ah, uh, you know, and, and cause here's another thing. 
the people who I typically find engage in this, I find them to be fairly vapid, spiritually speaking. You know what I mean? I, and, you know, there's because there's something about presenting an argument based solely on doctrine and dogma. But see, the thing is, is it's very difficult if you pay attention, it's going to be very difficult to find one of these debates that involves praxis. And I'm going to tell you why. Because praxis is the way in which actually the faith is experienced and developed. Praxis proceeds and it's fundamental to doctrine, really. It's not the other way around. People think it's doctrine and, and then praxis, but it's like the praxis is where it's at. And, and you know that because in many ways, your experience of your wife, your children, far outweighs your kind of quote unquote forensic knowledge of them. There's this aspect where you you hit this point where you're like, you know, I don't really know why, you know, I love my wife the way I do, right? It, it's the praxis, it's the experience. So this, which is, I'm glad we were here because I want to bring up this point in defense kind of of Jonathan, but it's kind of an indictment of him is like, I think part of it might be his pride again, because he didn't say anything because he's he could see he's outclassed, maybe, maybe. But you know what? Like, where's the love? Because that guy, Habibi, you know, everybody knows I'm a dummy, right? And Habibi would clearly outclass me. He's got the nice beard, he's got the the swag, he's you know, got the English accent, and he, he has a very, you know, kind of he's like very good Arabic. Yeah, he's he's got the Arabic. He's got a mendat level of like recall of, of scripture from Quran, whatever. But the thing is, is soul and heart. Because I'd be like, you know what, man, and and I'll just go to the praxis. I'll go to the experience. I'll go to love, and I'll speak to him about the love of Christ, the experience of Christ, because I know Christ, and that's the thing. I know yeah. Christ, so I'm not going to rely on blah 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 blah. I'll use. The fathers and scripture and dogma and doctrines and historical, you know, um, aspects, all that stuff to kind of like help frame an argument. But fundamentally, the thing is going to be based upon like my love of God. Right. And, and that's, that's such that a big difference, though. That's so why Christ is. is so cool, because like oftentimes and I've experienced this a lot. It's like one of my favorite things. Not not because I get like a gotcha. But like it literally just shows how good God is and like how good Christ is undoing like that kind of stuff, because like they're expecting you to meet them up here. They want to do it intellectually. You just go down low mm -hmm. and you just be like, no, this is the very earthly, the very real day to day reality of like, look, your image of God, that what you're portraying, your Allah, like that does not work for me at three o'clock in the morning when my son won't go to sleep mm -hmm. like that does not work for me like it's the love of christ in the way that christ is that's how he like and again I, like i said not too long ago i would walk away i don't care if i look stupid i would sure I, like what they would record it and be like orthodox christian stumped one confronted about his faith whatever i don't care that's fine with me because i'm not going to sit here and debate it on his level and yeah, like, but you wouldn't be stumped, Andrew. That's the, that, I th and I think that that's what Father's saying. It's like the person who's actually stumped, the person who's actually stumped is Muhammad Hijab. Mm -hmm. Because the one thing that he can't do is he can't actually talk about his experience of Allah. Maybe, but also he, like... Well, he, he, he I, as far as I've heard, he, 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 I, he never he has. <laughs> and I, and I'll, I'll, I'll actually flip it because I think it's important. What he's really stumped on is Christ, because he's like, I don't, and I believe him when he says it, I don't understand. He's like, when you were a little kid, you probably had it right, because he's basically saying, like, I don't get it. How can you believe in this? Yeah. He's stumped. He's stumped by the fact that people believe that Christ is God. It's like, and from his mind, which again, Islam is a religion of the world. Islam isn't from God. Islam is, is a made up religion. Just mm -hmm. like the atheists accuse us of. It's because it's just, that's why, I, listen, y'all, lean into the quote unquote non logical aspects. Be like, yeah, that you're right. It doesn't make sense. That's why it's God. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's why he's stumped because it's yeah. like, yeah, you, of course you're stumped because 
you don't know God, right? Yeah. And and so even when like Peter wants to talk about the transcendent coming down to the imminent, it's like, look, man, <laughs> you, you don't. You're meeting him over here, and you're getting that's yeah, like that's what not, I need. Mean. The like, clickbaity, like YouTube way of being owned in a debate, that's what, what happened to me. Like the clickbaity, like obviously this dude has no intellectual recourse for what this guy is saying. I'd be like, it's true. I don't because I don't need it. That's you don't not, need it. That's not a survival <laughs> tool for me. That's actually like I said this to someone the other day. I was like, they're like, I was like, you're very intellectual. I'm like, thank you. I'm like, it's not a compliment. <laughs> it's like it's a sickness there's something here you can't you are relying so much on your mind it's something that is not like your made-up fantasy world is not working much longer for you and you need to like break free of that and it's just like look okay like, like real time for those people they're looking to find a way to reconcile what's happened in the last three years for us we're like oh thank god it happened like that's the that's the difference you know what i'm saying like i see that every day father i see that pattern every like single like day. that's i mean that's the thing you know what i mean like if you're at a point where you're like yeah you know what thank god for for the last three years 2020 was like a blessing you're on the right path just keep going on that path because that's how you get out of that sickness that you know you're talking about andrew well let well excuse me that's not how you get out of it that's how you tell that it's a that's that the fever is dying down a little bit because you're starting to see things contrary to the way the rest of the diseased world is seeing it. Yeah. Remember, there's going to come a time when the world will go mad and say to those who aren't mad, you're mad. You're not like us. So the fever that everyone's bought into it's madness, right? They like, and that madness of, you know, basically everyone needs to be of the hive zombie mind. I, I, I understand his, uh, his honest, legitimate struggle. Like he, it legitimately doesn't make sense to him. Just like Christianity does not make sense to the world. And that's why the church is failing. Excuse me. That's why members of the church, the church isn't failing. Members of the church are failing so poorly, so badly because they're so desperately they are, they're like, you know, they're, they are enamored with the world and they want so desperately to impress the world and they don't want to impress Christ. Right. But Christ did, Christ didn't make sense to me, Father, until I was given the tools to begin to experience Christ. Sure. That was as, as, like, and I mean, look, I've got to, I, I, like, my, my formal education is in philosophy. Right. Like I've read all of these books, mm -hmm. Quran, all the Bible. All, I've read these books. But like. I actually realized that I had never read the gospel, any of the gospels through until I had had the experience, mm -hmm. because once I had had the experience, then I was reading a different book. Mm -hmm. But that's true for so many books. Mm -hmm. It's true for so many things. It's like if I was to read a book about Saipan right before I had ever come here, mm -hmm. a narrative that takes place in Saipan and a story that takes place in Saipan and the people of Saipan and everything. Sure, I could read the book and think, oh, that's a wonderful book. But after living here now for almost three years, were I to pick up that book and read it again, it's a different book Yeah. because of the experience. Yeah. Father, and I'm sorry, Sifri, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, and I mean, I think that that's... that's that's what I'm saying, Andrew, about like not not being lost because anybody who could speak from experience is going to be able to like it's it's one of those things where you're just like, well, what are you telling me? I've actually done it. Yeah. I'll, 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 I'll bring up one last example. This is topical. This, this popped off in my mind. I'm a software developer, right? I'm self-taught as a software developer. And one of the ways that I've, it's like being able to play by ear, right? Playing an instrument by ear. So like often, and I've had this throughout my career where like some big corporation would be like, oh, hey, you know, your recruiter showed us all these things that you did. And like, they'd start putting me through the HR process, like a big, like an Amazon or whatever. I would never, half of the time I would just boot myself and the other half of the time they would boot me. 
because immediately they'd be like wanting to throw all this jargon at me. And I'd be like, I don't look, I don't know what those words mean. Right. But if you were to show me with code, what that is and what it does, I guarantee you I've done it over and over and over again. Like I don't, so yeah. I, if you want me to build something, I'll build something for you right now. I've built all kinds of things that no one's ever built. Right. right. But if what you want from me is to pop back jargon to you, like that I would have learned in a, yeah, a you, computer science course, I can't do it for do you. Do you know the you know the story of um the bishop? We've talked about the bishop finds himself on the island and the monks, there's mm. like these three monks and they're arguing about you are, I, I don't think I don't think I've heard this. Go ahead. Yeah, this is Sorry. good. Go ahead, Andrew. I, I'm going to butcher it. You got it. Oh, all right. <clears throat> Put me on the spot. So I think it's having something to do with like the Nicene Creed, uh -huh. or like the uh, maybe it's the Nicene Creed or the Our Father. And basically, he's talking to these three monks, this bishop. He's correcting them and basically saying like, no, 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 no. It's this, and you kind of want to view it this way. Blah blah blah. No, no. He's kind of correcting these three monks, right? These three simple monks who are you know just in heavy praxis, you know, was praying daily stuff like that. And as he's sailing away, one of the monks runs across the water. And like runs up next to the boat. He's like, what did you mean by that thing that you were saying just a second ago? And the bishop's I like, I love it. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. You're good. <laughs> like, you're fine. Like, not a big deal. Just go back. You got it. I don't got it. And to I love it. That, um, there's a story that Father Cosmos talked about where a very simple monk thought that um, the Annunciation was a saint. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. yeah. He thought yeah. the Annunciation was a saint. So he prayed to Saint Annunciation. He thought he was like a Greek saint or something like that. And he'd get made fun of, blah, 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 you know, behind his back, you know, what a simple monk, blah, blah, blah. And then one day his brother was saying he was hungry and it's on there on the monastery on the side of a cliff. And he said, um, you know, I'm really hungry. And then he goes, you know, through the prayers of the Saint Annunciation, could you please provide us food? And he held his hand out and a fish jumped right into his hand. And then he like brought it inside. And he was like, you know what? I love it. Shut up. We're done. And this is like, <laughs> I think that's it. This is the point I'm maybe I'm trying to make. I'm not sure mm -hmm. about meeting people in this battlefield, this intellectual mind battlefield of their coming with their legions of troops, you know, their arguments, their things ready to go. And I'm just dropping my weapons and go, I'm not fighting this battle. Like, this is stupid. Like, I have better things to be doing right now. I'm gonna go somewhere else. We're like, or even better, this is not the real battle. Mm -hmm. Like the real battles over there. Like the real battles, like you have to descend down here. That's where the real battle is. This is not it up here. All this is is just intellectual sparring. Mm -hmm. And like I've said before, you might as well be debating like Tolkien lore. You know, like what year did like Saruman like you know join allegiance with sauron or something like that well it's it like, feels very like that because it is that yeah i mean <laughs> it's all intellectual it is that. yes because guess speaking. what because guess what all that stuff i mean listen man when they're facing the the great dread judgment none of that's gonna none of that's gonna matter yeah and i don't think it's it does not seem like it's to me, it does not seem like it's real to Jordan Peterson. I you mean, know, like, it does not seem like it's real. Well, when you look at, well, when you look at his responses, and again, this gets this isn't the whole thing with Rygar. These people, they flip out on him crying. And I'm like, look, man, a dude crying, if that's what it takes for, I mean, somebody pass me the onions. For real. If that's what it takes to to get a couple million views and to get somebody to listen to you and I'll put some, I'll smell some onions for you on screen and and cry it's like that's not indicative of that's not indicative of an actual experience of of the of the living god that's because well the, well but father maybe and maybe this is a good point to bring this up because and it's interesting that you bring this up because tears tears in prayer this, and this is a concept I don't think that we've really talked about, but I do see the fathers and saints talking mm -hmm. about, you know, tears. I've certainly mm -hmm. had at least one experience mm -hmm. uh, profoundly where the tears wouldn't stop. Yeah. Um, you know, as a part, as a, in, in sort of in the context of my baptism. I mean, when mm -hmm. you were here, that was probably the, 
one of the most profound ex- spiritual experiences I've ever had. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe we could talk a little bit about that because certainly the tears that Peterson has don't seem to be that because mine were certainly about being convicted mm-hmm. and that it was about, you know, and it doesn't seem like his tears come from his own if, conviction. It seems like I, a um, sympathetic tears, response. I mean, forgive me, I don't know the man's heart, but like I might, you know, I'm more referring to the s- s- situation yeah, where but, what's happening, I, right? I'm just going to say, because like his tears are tears of frustration. His tears are tears of frustration, not repentance, not conviction of frustration. You know what I mean? Which, I mean, there's there's validity to it, right? And so it's like, how can you say that? You can't judge a man. I'm like, well, I just look at the fruits. Because when did this interview come out? You know what I mean? That's not a man who's repentant of like, you know, barring his heart towards the divine. That's a man who's frustrated that like, I'm the smartest, you know, man on the planet. And I don't, you know, I like, I cannot crack this code. And I know that people have been like, oh, he's close. I'm like, yeah, you can be close, but super far away. And so, so there's that. The fathers do talk about the gift of tears and it's a real thing, right? But, but the gift of tears is a context. And there are the tears of the spirit that the soul will cry like you did, Cyprian, in your confession. And many of us have had moments of like a broken and contrite heart God will not despise. Absolutely. I'm going to tell you something. And I I want want people to understand this. You got to be careful. I'll tell you why. St. Gabriel of Georgia, he says, I'm going to paraphrase. I might have to look it up um, when when Andrew's and mine's riffing, but. He essentially says, you know, don't look for tears. Like, don't look for the physical tears. Look for the the brokenness of a heart. Mm. I have to look it up. And that's super important, especially now, because, you know, St. Gabriel was saying this in the time of, you know, he's also predicting things with, like, the Ivern icon, like, disappearing, like, from TV and all this stuff. So it's like there's a context of his prophecies, which I think are important to this point that we're talking about. And that is the psychological, the kind of mimetic facet of the psychological phenomena upon the person who would be a spiritual seeker is important for us to expose right now. Mm-hmm. If, if you understand what I'm saying, I know that was kind of like a lot. Go on, go cool on. Expand, expand, right expand on that. <laughs> expand on that a little bit, Father. Throwing yeah, a bunch please. of psycho babble out throw, there. Throwing a please. bunch of psycho. Okay, so. When you understand that, so mimetic, meaning, you know, we've talked about this before. Do you remember, Andrew? Remember, do you, I'm going to pop quiz you. Remember you asked, what's mimetic? Do you remember? Uh, well, it's the, it's the the dangerous idea, correct? Like that. Well, the it, M-M-I, I think you're talking about, right? M-I-M? Yeah, mimetic. Mim- mimetic. Mimetic. Oh, so, uh, pop quiz. Imitating. Oh right this kind Imitating. of okay okay imitative aspect of something right so people will witness something it's kind of like propaganda or brainwashing you witness something and it begins to influence you more times than not imperceptibly so that's what i mean okay. by mimetic. Okay? okay so the mimetic aspect of this psychological right it's, it's really putting this emphasis on a psychological experience which is which is fundamentally experienced as an emotional phenomena or experience and people confuse that for the spiritual yes that is you know i'll i'll just say as someone who's as as a priest a confessor spiritual father i spend a lot of time i don't tell people that's what i'm doing but i spend a lot of time trying to scrape those barnacles off of people Mm mm-hmm Right. And and I spent a lot of time trying to purge people of that so that they can have an actual experience of Christ. Mm-hmm. Because this correlative of an emotional experience, which a lot of people, you know, are are you know, their their noose has been stained with these things, whether they're coming out of a charismatic experience, addiction, you know, I mean just being raised in our culture, given that mimetic aspect of seeing seeing what is valuable, music that is 
evocative of emotional highs and yeah all these things are how we relate to experience and, and depth you know what i mean and this is where you get people who end up being junkies they're they're emotional junkies they need to have some kind of drama and some kind of like high to get them you know engaged and the tradition is quite the opposite for yeah. all the reasons we've talked about in the past prelist you know prelist and slash delusion all these things when you put them together it's not one small thing it's it's multiple aspects where it hits you and then you find yourself simply deluded right and the thing is is christ the tradition is 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 the, the tradition needs to experience in this generation in this generation in such a way that those things are stripped they need to be stripped from us so that we can actually enter into a space of genuine repentance yes does that make sense because yeah. kind of coming back full circle with this little section people it, it's a real hard thing and there's a there is a place for emotion there is a place for it but it's very limited because most people's emotional faculties are are broken or twisted absolutely and the experience of christ and the kingdom of god is is one of purity not that you need to be pure to experience it in in the sense that i'm talking about but it but it is pure mm -hmm. so therefore since it is pure when we come with all these layers that are inhibiting our ability to kind of really connect you know it's just it's kind of like you just got to strip the layers so you can actually feel what, what you're coming up against if that makes yeah. sense and all of the affect of emotion all the affect of what we think we're how we're supposed to act or how we're supposed to feel <clears throat> excuse me those things get in the way of truly experiencing christ in other words this is where people come up to this antichrist spirit of they are wanting to encounter something that's more a projection of what they've been fed yes. than the true Christ. Yes. And so for Jordan Peterson, this is, you know, his God looks more like the Frankenstein of, you know, young Nietzsche and uh, I don't know. Zeus. Huh? Zeus. Yeah. Like, I don't know. Like, Sprinkle a little bit of, I don't know, uh, Carl Barth or something like that. You know, you you sprinkle in some sort of, you know, Barth or someone. It's like, okay, great. Like, there's that. There's a useful place for God, but that's not that. That's not the experience. You know but I mean? he's basically saying that, isn't he, Father? Where he's like, I'm trying to reconcile all these things, and by all these things, he means all the things that I think are interesting and cool. And all of this, I'm trying to reconcile them all. Well, all the things that, all the things that are me, that are me. Yeah, you, you know what I mean. All the thing, all the things that are me. I mean, gosh, I you don't want? He's trying to create. It's, it's a person. Yeah, I maybe I don't want to go I that far. God this. in His image. I didn't want to say it, but yeah, like, I don't want to do this. But like, I just, you know, I, see, the thing is, I, it's, it's fascinating to me because. You know, being being uh, a therapist for a lot of years and having clients, and I remember, I don't even know, if I I remember watching something a couple of years ago, and he was talking about he still had some clients, but I don't even know where he's at with clients, or whatever. But it's like, and I know, and I know this from just knowing people. You know, sometimes a lot of times therapists they're more interested in their career, mm -hmm. and they see clients more as like interesting things to observe, like animals mm -hmm. or like like they're in a zoo then they do human beings that's yeah. that's i'm just telling you that's a fact yeah um, i'm not saying all therapists i'm just saying there's a lot of therapists that are like that and things are used in their education to be like well you need to have a certain measure of you know healthy you know clinical you know kind of distance and like all this stuff but what like, do you mean like dispassion like, well that's what they would call it i know like, that's what i'm saying that's, like, that's what they would call it the but church, like church has got it you know, I, I just, I look at that. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because, you know, um, one of the things about a genuine experience, this is why, 
you know, there's certain things that we look at that are fundamental to the Christian experience, fellowship, don't forsake the gathering of the brethren, the monastic community, the synabitic community, the family. Like the, the those things, this these are the kind of foundational, incarnational aspects of of, of God, of the faith, of, of of the worship and the uniting of oneself with God. And so what is what am I talking about? I'm talking about you learn to love people that you kind of can't stand. You you learn to love people that have real defaults. Or, I mean, not defaults, defects. You know what I mean? When you're a therapist, you're, you're, you're in a position of power and it's just like, well, it's very easy to kind of like begin to have this very um, soft misanthropic tendencies towards people like, ah, you know, you're just kind of like. Well, because everybody's messed up except for you. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You're not messed up. How could you be messed up? If exactly. you were messed up, they couldn't come to you. You couldn't do anything good. So you must be exactly. perfect. Exactly. And so, again, you know, I'm not saying that this is all his motivation because I've seen some great interviews where he's like, you know, you seem like you're mad. I'm not mad. I love my job. People come up to me and say, you saved my life. You know, like, okay, great. You know, I, I appreciate that he, he says that or that he has, he can appreciate what he's done for people. I, I can appreciate the fact that he wants to bring about world peace, but like, and I can also appreciate where for a lot of people in this situation, like I lose them because I just, I'm a fundamentalist to them. And it's just like, I'm not interested in world peace. You know what I mean? Don't make me start singing a Cro Mag song to you. For real. You know I mean? For real. Like, like I'm like, just I'm my not, head away. Yeah, I'm not I'm not interested in it. Yeah. But the, I, I, the Lord said he came not to bring peace, but a sword. A sword. And I and 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 again, this gets us back full circle to this paradox. Like there's this weirdness about when you know someone either knows christ or is connected to him there's this weirdness where it's like the paradoxes they get it and and they and they they bear witness to it you know what i mean it's like how can you be actually a loving person at the same time be kind of cold like how's that work well when you know christ that's how it is because the thing that you're perceiving it's not a coldness towards whatever but it's just like hey i'm powerless I'm powerless with this. It's like, unless God moves in you and reveals certain things to you, it's just like, I know you're not going to get it. And people perceive that as arrogance, coldness, whatever. I'm just, I'm laying out one of those paradoxes. Right yeah. now. You know what I'm saying? And that is what Habibi and, you know, Jordan and like, I pray that Jonathan's not there, but he might be, you know, along for the ride. That's where people they just can't, they can't reconcile it. And so they work extra hard to try to do that. And that's the thing is like, who do, you know, who do you, who, who do you say that I am? Yeah. You know what I mean? Who do you say that I am? And I think it's real important. Forgive me, I just want to finish this. No, you're off. good. I just think it's really important for us to kind of come back to that simplicity of who do men say that I am? Cause that's because we we've never left that we we've, we've never left that that's it's more valid now than when he said it in the ears of 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 living breathing men who do who do men say that I am who do you say that I am and I would say that you know to those three men there you know who do you say that he you know that he is because that because to me that's where everything rises and falls in that sense. I, I think I think that oh sorry go ahead Andrew. Oh um I Cyprian go ahead because I'm going to divert us back to something that Father said earlier and I I think you have a good follow up for this. I th I think that this also stood out to me Father listening to Jordan Peterson and Muhammad Hijab speak in as Peterson said a rel a religious way of th that's a religious way of thinking about things mm -hmm. is this. And, you know, it's called because it's called talking to Muslims about Christ. Right. And it's I think that this idea of knowing Christ as Christ, the living God mm -hmm. here, the person like now, right now, you know, that's that's what's because 
that's what's missing in this in, in the the intellectualization i think can only come because because i myself let me finish it can only come from a scenario where the the, the subject that you are discussing is not alive in the moment there with you, present with you. Like it's very difficult to intellectualize something that you are in the midst of and that you are experiencing, right? Because the mystery is always going to be there with whatever you're experiencing. Like I feel like the intellectualization can't happen until you're not, does that make sense? What I, I know I'm not articulating this well, but I just feel like it's like, you know, the articulation always has to come from like a stepping back away from something that's not there or observing something that is past. Mm -hmm. But it's like in the midst of, and I think this might be something you're getting at as well, Andrew, is like in the midst of an experience of Christ, in the midst of living a life where you're trying to experience Christ, I think it can kind of, and maybe this is why theologians are like real theologians is something very, very special is that it like to try to articulate anything other than like your experience seems to me very difficult to do. Yeah, it is. Um, so I'm going to divert us because we've got a couple minutes left and I wanted to touch on this with father real quick um, about tears. Cause I think that there's this whole thing that's happening now. And it's, I think it's a pendulum swinging to the other end of, stiff up or step up or lip and all that you know where there's like this like emotional invocation of you can't touch someone once they're crying so like so i see it time to time when i'm counseling um that people will relay these without a doubt traumatic experiences you know but again if we're looking on a, on a spectrum, this is much more towards the middle than like maybe some other things that like um, some other experiences that I've heard. So somebody will say like, and he didn't even wish me a birthday, happy birthday, like once in our whole marriage, you know, like, and once they're crying, you're a jerk if you come after them. You know what I mean? It's the same thing with the talk show hosts coming out. And oh, by touch them, you meant to criticize. The, you didn't mean yeah. actually physically touch them. Oh, no, 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 no. I oh, wouldn't do that in the first yeah, place. Got it, got it, got it. Because yeah. if someone's crying, like, trying to understand, I was a I, confused. My skin is towards the sun and I'm running out the door because I'm like, I can't do this. But if, if, like, so lest we never question, you know, uh, what's his name? The talk show host, Jimmy Fallon's sincerity as a good human being because he cried when Russia invaded Ukraine. Let us never, ever, like, question the sincerity of, like, the pain of, like, Lady Gaga because she cries in an interview. You know, like, you know, the, the phrase, like, crocodile tears. Mm -hmm. And, like, um, like the tears of self-pity. Like, the tears of, like, look at me. Like, I need attention. You Pity. know? Yeah. Self-pity. And that's the whole thing is and so like there's like this um it's like this like you can't go after someone once they start crying like i can't critique someone if they're crying like i can't sit there i mean i do i do i go are you done okay so here's where you're at fault here like here's where this is actually not a not a them problem this is a you problem and I've run into that situation before where it's like, I have to just sit there and wait for them to be done and then say like, okay, well, you know, pity parties suck because there's only room for one. And then because I'm not coming, like I've RSVP no to your pity party. Like I'm not going to do that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, ex I wouldn't expect any person I actually respect. If, if, if a person I actually respected did that, it would be so off putting to me. It would be so like it, I would be cog that cause like cognitive dissonance or something within me where I'm just like, who is this person now? Like, where is this like spirit coming from of you needing to like cry for the bad things that have happened to you? And sure, I guess there's some room for that. There's a, a room to hurt, you know, I suppose like of, wow, yeah, I really didn't like this thing and I'm crying because it hurts, you know, it sucks. But like, it's not like a feel sorry for myself type of thing. It's not like a, who has it worse than me, you know? Um, 
And it's really interesting because, um, no, I'm going to stop there. I'm not going to go any further. Like, because the wraparound of me having to connect everything, it would take too much. And I'm not sure I'm in the right place to do that. Plus to say there's a Batman comic where there's a direct parallel where basically Batman goes over the top because he just got dumped by Catwoman. And he beats the slot, the snot out of Mr. Freeze, even though Mr. Freeze is innocent of the thing that Batman, Batman is emotionally compromised. So he makes a mistake, beats the, the snot out of Mr. Freeze. Then Bruce Wayne bribes his way onto the jury to get Mr. Freeze out of a conviction because he knows that he was wrong. But it's interesting what the author Tom King does. He that he does this whole parallel between Job and Batman, like he does this whole thing about like what happens when um something bad happens to a person and like basically like bruce wayne is explained to the rest of the jurors so i guess i am doing this real quick i'll make it short it is explained to the jurors like there's this part where job gets a little bit upset and asks god like you know what's going on and you know tom king is not a christian so he kind of is kind of like not exactly nailing it But he basically says, like, God is like, who are you to question me? Like, who are you to, like, question, like, what I, why I am doing what I am doing? So to throw a pity party. Yeah. Like, I couldn't find the quote. I was looking for it. I I want to take what you're saying, go back to Rygar. And remember, remember Rygar? Emotions. The the Satanist, the South African Satanist. And remember the big thing was like the tears disarmed you. Yes. That's that's what I was getting to. Like that. Yeah. It's just super important to, to because again, you know, it's the reason why people were so enamored with Pope Francis at first, you know. The the kind of the 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 wielding of emotion and the playing to sentimentality. You know, um it's it's it is counterproductive to the spiritual life. It's counterproductive to the life in pursuing repentance to be united to Christ. It just, it just is because self-pity is such a disgusting thing. It's a swamp. It, it, it really is. And so, you know, it's, if you struggle with self-pity, it's, it's, it's a bigger obstacle in your life than, than you probably realize. I guarantee it, you know, and that's why, you know, for me, I'm just like, ah, you know, I, I don't. This, this is this is a paradox. I really don't care about your tears. I really don't. I really don't. Why? Here's a paradox. Because I actually care about you. I actually have love for your immortal soul. <laughs> right, and the caring of the tears. That's just. You know, that's a very fleshly low thing, you know, and all kinds of weird things can happen with that. Well, I can't care about my daughter's tears when she's crying about how she wants chocolate and it's seven o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And she's crying about it's like, no, I do do not care about that. that. Because because again, to be (laughs) frank, right, I'm sure I'm sure if someone wanted to, they could take that out of context and be like, oh, see. I'm not talking about someone who's like genuinely weeping because they cheated on their wife or because, you know, their child just, they found out their child has cancer. So that's obviously not what I'm talking about. Of course. That's obviously not what I'm talking about, you know, but all the other stuff. yeah, Self-pity you're talking it's about. Self-p- I'm self-pity. Talking about self-pity. Yeah. And I'm talking no. about self-pity. Because, but because finding out your child has cancer and you cry is not, I mean, that's not self-pity. No, and I mean that's genuinely something that is. There's yeah. a lot. There's a lot going on there, there's and it's not. It's things. not necessarily about you. It's true. It can be true sorrow and fear. Yeah, yeah. And so there's 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 a sorrow that leads to death. There's a sorrow that leads to you know repentance. And so all that to be said, it's just important because in light of kind of everything we've been talking about, you know, I think. I think more and more to make it to make it simple, I think more and more people are hopefully seeing the need to really pursue truth. 
because you know i mean again God, i feel so bad man just like i i just <laughs> jordan Pierre is really entertaining there's stuff, but, but like we're what we're talking about is you know even though it's couched in the in the context of like entertainment i guess it's ultimately we're always talking about truth truth as a person and it matters because you know these times the life has always demanded it but these times demand that we be just more and more vigilant about pursuing truth and not being distracted with anything that would prop itself up as truth or against the truth you know and, and that's is a, is that's what in that. it can be so maddening and then i think you know we should move on to a question real quick because i have a good one and wrap mm -hmm. up the last 10 15 mm -hmm. minutes but that's what's so maddening for a lot of people in early recovery. I'm like, well, how do you feel about this? And they're like, well, I feel this. I'm like, that's not true. You're not feeling. That's not how you feel. I'm like, okay, no, no, no. Okay, yeah, I could see. I could, okay, I feel this. I'm like, mm, that's not it either. And, you know, like, Father's done it to me. I've done it to other people where I'm just like rambling, 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 rambling. He's like, oh, I just am really, really mad about the way work went today. Like, there it is. That's the truth that's what's actually going on that's the thing and and to be specific like uh a specific example in which father did that to me i was meeting him when and i was at a time a spiritual low point in my life in which i was not really doing anything no praxis no practice nothing i was maybe following my prayer rule and that was it my wife was seeing some stuff that i was not seeing about what was going on 2020 ish blah 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 she was kind of ahead of me a little bit because she was really seeing some stuff she's following intuition i was talking to father about it i went to this whole long diatribe about like oh i just think god isn't like me because i my own i struggle with my own dad blah 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 and then, oh male authority figures that's why i have a problem with male saints sometimes all of which is none of which is true by the way none of that is true and then i threw like 10 minutes of father just sitting there looking kind of like he looks right now just sitting like me just talking to him talking to him talking to him i finally was like i guess it just bothers me that my wife is seeing things that i'm not he's like there it is that's it. That's what's bothering you. And I'm like, okay. All right. Yeah. Because that's why journaling is important. You got to get there. You can't like, you got all this crap. You got to yeah. get out of the way. You also got to want to get there. You yeah. got to want to get there. Yeah. You got to, you got to want. Which self pity yeah. is one of the things that keeps you from wanting to get there. Oh, man. Yeah. Is it ever. Because self pity right. is kind of like spiritual self abuse. If you know the code word for self abuse, I have mm -hmm. talking about the big old M word. Yeah. Um, okay, Father, I have a question here from Stealth. Is their name? Um, what is the Orthodox teaching regarding where evil originates from? I think I recall Father Turbo saying something along the lines of "No evil or sin comes from God." Paraphrasing here because I might, uh, I may have what he, I may have heard it wrong. However, it's pointed out to me to someone outside the faith that evil is created, supported by the pride of Luf Lucifer and the fallen angels, and they in turn create were created by God. As God is the creator of all things, darkness and light, then God not only permits evil for growth through suffering, but technically is the origin of evil. Regretfully, I was unprepared uh, for the argument and found myself unable to refute it. One thing I forgot to, oh, one thing I realized I forgot to add was that this person also said that God was not only created, but supports all including evil until he doesn't do you need me to go over anything i know i kind of read it kind of fast but basically or it's all evil until he doesn't um, i'm not sure i get that part either uh maybe he supports all evil until uh judgment day almost like god's capricious like i'll do this until i don't want to then i don't uh, like that. that wasn't the way i took it it was till the end of days he allow he he supports evil until the end of days. Like I will support. Oh, I don't. So like kind of passively by not doing anything about it. I yeah I guess it's like if um as long as it's serving a purpose I support it until it doesn't. Like I if I were an evil person and I was supporting I don't know Cyprian's run for mayor I'd be like Cyprian I'll support you as long as it benefits me and then I'm done. You know you know what I mean. Like then I'll move on to something else. But basically. If God originated, if God has created all things and God created Lucifer and Lucifer is the origin, it, it can all be traced back to God. You know what I mean? So evil can be traced back to God. Good. Like in a, in a nutshell, he's like, if God is the creator of all things and evil is a thing. So God created. is God the creator of evil. Okay. No problem. No problem. 
You bang this out in five minutes. No problem. So evil has no life in of itself. Evil is the absence of good. Lucifer was created good. And the the leaving <clears throat> the leaving of that natural leaving of his intention, meaning God's intention for for his his creation, his purpose, um, that is what is evil. And the fact that God allows him to do that is evidence of God's goodness, actually. Yes. Yeah. Could it could it, Father, could could a good analogy be something like people think that there's a such thing as hot and cold, but really cold, no such... is, cold is the absence of heat. Yeah, cold there's only heat. Exist. Yeah, cold doesn't exist. Cold is the absence of heat. There's right. So evil is just the muck left behind when God withdraws. Or or when yeah, you could kind of say that in one sense, but really when I'm not know, sure I understand. So I so, so, so here's the thing, right? God created sentient beings, animal uh, excuse me, angels and humans with a measure of freedom. Right? That's a gift he gave. In that gift he doesn't you know, renege on. He's just like, that's a gift that's given, right? This is this is not the source, but this is what facilitates evil in that sense. Because Lucifer and you know those who fell with him chose to leave their their original state. And the the leaving of that is what is what is evil. That's where evil comes from. Okay. All right. Which this is important in the sense that like you get people who go too far into the symbolic uh, wankery uh, of like, yeah, you know, evil is not even like, you know, evil is just purely, you know, the the demons are just purely a psychological, mythological, archetypical projection of man's you know, base desires and blah, 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 right? Um, or people will be like, well, you know, there really isn't the kind of personal aspect. There's a personal aspect to evil. But then they're like, well, but you said it doesn't exist. And and in order for something to not exist, therefore it can't have personhood. But the thing is, is that the personhood that we're speaking of in regards of the fallen ones, this is, this is a kind of direct... Um, experience a revelation of their evil and that they left their state and so it's it's this horrible disfiguring of personhood that lucifer as an entity leaves the goodness of his original state right for corruption and is and is this kind of he becomes this abomination in which evil is now Lucifer is to the spiritual world what kind of like Frankenstein, you know, kind of like in the sense of philosophical, like with ontology and stuff like that, to what the Frankenstein is. Like the Frankenstein isn't alive, but it is, right? You, you understand what I'm saying? Like the Frankenstein, it's a living being, but like, what is it? Uh, Frankenstein was the doctor, not the, the monster. monster. The monster. The, the, Frankenstein, the, Frank, the Frankenstein Thank monster. You. <laughs> Frankenstein's monster. Thank you. So, so Father, is it is it maybe an idea of like order as versus disorder that that god is god's creation is created with an order and then to fall out of that consciously fall out of that order into dis and to choose disorder is to choose evil i mean yes but that's not the core of it because disorder okay. is definitely a property of evil okay it's definitely a property of the demons because it's an affront to god because part of order is one of god's attributes and energies you know it's like mm. logos right but like i'm just the point being is evil doesn't have an existence in of itself it's the absence of the good okay that's it is why not they, it is not created yeah is, that's why evil is do, not created the dualistic thing of like you need to have evil and good it's like no that's why 
no nothing is neutral yeah because that's it's either evil or good correct so because there can't be nothing there isn't there can't be, there isn't there well isn't. and interestingly first chapter and i know that probably it doesn't translate exactly from the hebrew but first chapter of genesis god god creates and he looks and he says it's good yes mm -hmm. And then he creates and he looks and he says, it's good. So like it's saying that his creations are good, but before, so then what's before that is not created. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what's before that is, so this is the thing. God is uncreated. Period. Yes. And everything else is created, including yes. the demons. Yes. Right. Period. Full stop. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so everything was created good. Mm -hmm. I created everything good. And God gave the angels and man freedom. Mm -hmm. Right. That's where you, that's where evil is, is wrought. That's not the source of evil, but that's where evil, that's like the, the means by which evil is manifested is freedom. So it's the choice. It's the choice. So it's, it's about the choice. God actually gave the Got choice. It. Because what that is, that's not love, right? God, God gives the choice, and both man and the angels. But the angels' choice to evil to reject God is different than ours. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, it's different than ours. We 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 choose in a measure of ignorance. Yes. Okay. okay. The angels don't. The ang That's why when the whole thing like even the angels were the, the angels have zero ignorance. So sure. the angels are are so the 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 fallen ones are really evil. They're, like they're they they're evil. more they're evil incarnate. They're more they're, evil than a human being could ever be oh, because they lack ignorance. Ever, ever. Which is which is why this whole thing of like when people Got talk it. about like oh evil like just man's projections. I'm like yeah. Once you've encountered a demon, once you've mm -hmm. encountered mm -hmm. truly a fallen mm -hmm. spirit. Mm -hmm. I don't care what you say to me. I mean, I don't care what you say. It's like, it's just, it's just not, <laughs> you know what I mean? Always it's, smell and like feel Christ. Like you kind of know sometimes with discernment that that's Christ. And then you always know when it's demonic. Like once, once you experience it, you're like, yep, that's that. Like I mean, you just, when a little, person walks in and their eyes are practically black and you're just like, feel it coming off of them. You're like, yeah, I, I don't know what to do with you. Like there's there's, no, there's, there's so, no so, so father, so, so is it our ignorance that allows us to be fundamentally allows us to be saved? Because now I'm thinking, forgive them father for they know not what they do. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So and our ignorance is also a gift because the fathers, some fathers, excuse me, some fathers will talk about, you know, our, the garments of skin are, are, a mercy because if we were to actually see what was really going on we just we would just handle it. we would like, we could not handle it yeah um so there you go Very Stealth. edifying thank you yeah um okay i think that's about two hours um so yeah, that's two hours the thing i wanted to say there's a bunch of people who have reached out for father's contact information I have not reached out back to you. I just got a blessing to give it. So everyone who's awaiting an email back about that, I will get back to you just so everyone knows. Keep the questions coming. And I've yet to put in an auto response for everyone emailing, but please keep coming. Like I'm, I'm answering questions as we're going through. I love them. There are a lot of- What is your email address? Oh yeah. Andrew at Royal Path Network. Andrew Royal at- Royalpath.network. Andrew at Royalpath.network. Um, please send stuff. Please send stuff. It's it's like it's caused. It's been the um, initiator of a lot of really really good conversations. Um, really really like really good conversations. Some stuff I've even gotten stuff out of. And I mean I'm I'm the host of Royal Path, and I'm getting stuff out. No, I'm just kidding. It's 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 been really beneficial. I think. Um, and a lot of times it seems like uh, it puts a good it puts a good fire beneath all of us. Um, we also have the playlist and i wanted to ask you father live on air what era because i went to go put bad brains on there on the playlist but what era of bad brains do you want me to put on there i thought about putting blowing bubbles on there but that seemed a little facetious like i was like ah that might be a little bit too on the nose 
but I was I'm more of a rock for light guy. Like that's the one I that's really my favorite album. Okay, that's what I'm gonna put on there then. Rock for light, like I against I is sweet. I really like it, but for me, I think that's like that perfect X Y yeah. axis of who Bad Brains is and who they should be was Rock for Light. So um I'll put that on there. Uh we have that playlist on Spotify, it's Royal Path Podcast Music, something like that. You'll find it. Um we also have our merch store. None of the money goes to us. It goes to the church at royalpath. I mean, technically it goes to me. But... <laughs> <laughs> well, in a roundabout way, it pays our priest so he doesn't have to get a second job at McDonald's. So, um, and eat the next. Where he would never eat. Where he would, yeah, would never eat. eat. You know. It's Cyprian, royalpath.merch. No, royalpath.store. I'm never going to get it. <laughs> never, ever going to get it. Royalpath.store. Um and i think i think that is it um, designers what's that designers designers oh yes so oh, thank so you. there was a uh something was brought up and this is a, so this is a call out i'll just make the call out this this is a call, call out. out to anyone who is a graphic designer who would like to be a part of this project um I personally think that we have fantastic thumbnails for YouTube. <laughs> however, <laughs> however, uh, it has been brought up that the thumbnails could perhaps be a little more eye-catching, and I don't think I don't have a problem with that. Uh, I don't think anybody has a problem with that. So, if you are a graphic designer who would like to do a little something for, for free. the show, for free, for, for free, who would like to do a little something as your contribution to this project. Uh, we would love to have you, and you can uh, reach out to Andrew at royalpath.network. And uh, and now here's the only thing. Here's the only thing. We're here every week except for the weeks that we're not. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to take this on, the only thing that, that I would ask, and I, I, I guess I will ask this on behalf of all of us, is that uh, please, if you're thinking about taking this on, please try to commit to continue to do it because I think it would be a real shame if we had just a few weeks of some really cool thumbnails. And then we had to go back to the thumbnails that I make, right. Yeah. Which I think are wonderful They're by the way, lame. Lame. <laughs> but, but it would, but it would be great if you could commit to the whole, to, to just do it for as long as we do the project. Uh, we, and we would love to have you on the team, which is That's for the it. foreseeable future, foreseeable future. Indeed. Yeah um so there's that please reach out please let us know um it doesn't have to be crazy just something that maybe a little bit more eye eye catching or something like that than what we got now and if there's no interest that's not really a big deal either because i still i like our thumbnails so mm -hmm. um so thank you please reach out and thank you for having a good night bye 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 guys <laughs>